Good morning and welcome to our next uh, lunch with your legislators. We are so glad to have you joining us today. Uh, my name is State Representative Bridget Kelly and I am here with my colleagues Rep. Cedric Denson, Rep. Jessica Miranda, and Representative Catherine Ingram. And we are here to talk all things higher education. So we are going to briefly go through uh, our agenda today, what you can expect from our program. Uh, and we're really appreciative that you uh, took the time to join us for our lunch with your legislators. So today uh, we have an esteemed panel with representatives from the University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati State, uh, Xavier University, and the American Association of University Professors, Ohio Conference, and you'll get to learn a little bit more about them uh, when Representative Denson uh, goes through our guests today. If you have questions, you can add them to the chat on Zoom, or if you're joining us via Facebook Live, you can add, you can ask questions uh, in the comments. And so, our presenters will go through briefly and talk a little bit about their organizations and then we will be taking Q&A in the second part of our meeting this morning. But first, we're going to go through with a few introductory comments from our uh, other legislators. So I'm going to kick it over to Representative Denson uh, for a few comments. Or maybe we'll circle back to Rep Denson and we'll go to Rep Miranda for comments. Thanks, Rep Kelly. And I'll just give a reminder to make sure you're unmuting uh, before you speak. Um, and I just wanted to cover today the um, updates in terms of the governor's plan for the reopening of Ohio. So, of course, today is the day, May 15th for salons, barber shops to reopen. And I know there's been a lot of reporters out there today covering the lines at several different places. Um, and we just wanted to um, kindly remind you that while you are taking advantage of the certain sectors of our economy reopening, make sure you're also too following all of the safety guidelines that each business is putting out there for you. They are trying to do their best to keep people safe. And this is about respecting your fellow American or your fellow Ohioan. It's not about um, anything that has to do with taking any of your rights away. We just wanna make sure that we're respecting other people. So um, today is May 15th, the day salons and barber shops open. Um, today is also the day that restaurants and um, other places that serve um, food and drinks can open their outdoor dining areas. So um, please take advantage of that if you can to support our local businesses. And then May 21st is another good date to remember. May 21st will be restaurants and bars with inside dining opening back to the public. So again, just our soft plug to make sure that you're following all safety guidelines to protect your fellow neighbors. Um, we would greatly appreciate that. And I will kick it over to Rep Denson. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us again. I hope everybody's staying safe. I'm really excited about today's conversation with Higher Ed. There is a lot to learn as we're going through these times. I just want to give a quick update on some things that we're paying attention to. Um, as you may have read or seen or heard, we're back in Columbus and we've had session and back in committee, so a lot going on there. But some things that I have talked about from the beginning of doing these town halls that I'm still paying attention to very closely is um, our prison system and how we're dealing with the cases of COVID-19 in our prisons. Um, education, of course, is what we're talking about today with higher ed, but how schools will be um, opening back up is something that we're paying very, very close attention to as well. And every other thing you can imagine, um, that could be going on right now just making sure that all families are staying safe so just so you all know we are back in our offices so uh, you can reach out anytime you need anything to any of us as we continue to do these updates thanks so much uh, thanks rep denson and now we're gonna uh hear a few comments from state representative Catherine ingram uh thanks very much i'm going to be brief because i do plan to come back a little later and give some remarks from the chancellor's office that they just sent me this morning. So I'm gonna make sure that I kind of highlight what they sent me and want us to, to cover 
But uh, I also want, while we're talking openings, that as of yesterday, the governor has um, indicated that daycares will be opening as of the 31st of, of May, uh, which of course is a Sunday. So I'm interested to see if he really meant June 1. But either way, that's going to be a very interesting kind of opening and we'll have to be able to see how that's going to work because people can't go back to work unless there's somewhere to take their children or unless they take them to grandma and then here again we've we've exasperated exacerbated the problem that we already have so um as cedric denson indicated rep denson indicated we are working hard in columbus trying to get a lot done and so um thank you so much for joining us today uh, thank you so much, all of you representatives, Miranda Denson and Ingram for those comments. Uh, and I believe Representative Denson is going to introduce us to our esteemed panel of experts this morning. Thank you so much, Rep Kelly. Um, really excited. I know all of our presenters today and excited for them to be able to share some things going on with us. First, we are going to introduce Karen Ryan. Karen is a native of Springfield, Illinois, graduated from Miami University in 1995 and from the DePaul University College of Law in 1998. Currently, Karen serves as the Executive Director, Government Relations for the University of Cincinnati. In this role, Karen is responsible for leading the university's legislative and political interests before legislators and the agency officials at the local, state, and federal levels of government, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Karen Ryan. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, and thank you to Representatives Kelly, Ingram, Miranda, and Denson for this opportunity to, to speak to everyone this morning. Um, we're very happy to be here and talk a little bit about University of Cincinnati um, at sort of a, at an institutional level, as well as how it is that we're responding to this public health crisis. So as I'm sure most of you all know, the University of Cincinnati is a public research university, and this year our enrollment is over 46,000 students. We have over 400 degree programs, and the president's strategic vision of Next Lives Here is really aimed at making a positive difference in our community and our society. And we do so by educating the next generation of leaders. With our enrollment of over 46,000 uh, 46, students this year, we are at our seventh year of consecutive growth and our graduation rate continues to rise. We work towards advancing knowledge and creativity to making our world a better place, and we've been able to capture this year in that effort over $400 million in research endeavors. We do our work to advocate with for our university and engage with our community for power for impact and, and change in our communities. And we've also been focusing on preparing for those economic unknowns, and that's currently what we're facing right now with this public health crisis. So in talking about that a little bit, we want to make sure that we, we talk about the president and the university's overall priorities. First and foremost is the health and safety of our students, faculty, and staff, and the continuity of our educational mission. Now, as you can imagine, there's been several impacts across the university with the advent of COVID-19. And talking a little bit about that, you know, one of the things we want to highlight is that the university has been open and functioning throughout this entire crisis. We have been servicing our students as well as supporting our faculty and staff as we transition to online learning. We did so successfully in March. We've been able to transition students early out of their residence halls and provide emergency housing to those who couldn't go home for a variety of reasons, if they're international students or for safety reasons couldn't go home. We've been supporting students through the CARES funding received from the federal government, as well as providing partial refunds of housing and fees to students. Our overall financial impact is changing day to day as circumstances with the health crisis change as does our financial situation. So we've been able to continue monitoring that and we anticipate that that will be fluid from now through a stabilization of the crisis. Our current response is that our continuing, we are continuing our summer programs online and servicing our students for, via online learning throughout the summer. We've been responsive to community needs in terms of providing and manufacturing PPE, as well as working towards making uh, our dorm space available and working with our healthcare first responders and frontline workers to protect their safety. And right now we are actively planning to return to campus in the fall. We're looking at a phased in approach right now and seeking input from across campus and really following the science. Our, the task force for our return to campus efforts 
include public safety, representatives from the president's office, academic affairs and student affairs. And we really are working every day towards what that return to campus looks like over the summer and then with the fall semester beginning in August. So thank you again for the opportunity to talk to everyone this morning. Thank you so much and thank you to everyone at the university for a commitment of making sure that our kids are safe and being a community partner through these difficult times. We really appreciate it. Um, next up, we're going to go on to Dr. Monica Posey, the president of Cincinnati State. Uh, after a business career with AT&T Company, Dr. Posey moved into higher education and has been at Cincinnati State 28 years in various roles. Dr. Monica Posey became the president in 2016 and has worked to energize the college with a collaborative leadership style and a vision for increasing student success and strengthening employer engagement. Dr. Posey's list of recognitions include Business Courier Woman Who Mean Business and Greater Cincinnati YWCA Career Woman of Achievement. She is a graduate of Cincinnati USA Regional Chamber 2010 Leadership Cincinnati class and serves on boards in Greater Cincinnati at the Greater Cincinnati United Way, Arts Way, the Holocaust and Humanity Center, Grad Cincinnati, and the Health Collaborative. Dr. Posey holds a Doctor of Education from the University of Cincinnati, a Master of Business Administration from Walton School, University of Pennsylvania, and a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. Dr. Posey and husband, Reverend Dr. Michael J. Posey, live in Green Township. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Monica Posey. All right, thank you very much. Uh, first, we appreciate the opportunity to share about Cincinnati State, but also Ohio's community colleges. There are 23 community colleges in our state, and we're all committed to workforce development and student success. We stand out because we're affordable, and we provide access to individuals of all different types of backgrounds and economic levels. At Cincinnati State, we actually educate about 10,000 different students per year. That's in workforce training, in short and long-term certificates, associate degrees, and also this fall, two applied bachelor's degrees. We stand out because of our cooperative education program. It's integrated in the curriculum. So our students actually learn in traditional classroom models, but work in jobs that are relevant to their major field of study. We do great things. We certainly are responding to the pandemic. We have remote classes and remote services. We have counseling and advising and all types of services to support the students. We've also emphasized the need for technology and providing students with the computer skills that they need to be successful remotely. We want to emphasize that as we look at the pandemic, we are concerned about the funding. We have been truly supported. The recognition and the appreciation of community colleges has continued over the years. We appreciate that. But as we look at what's happening with the state, there could be some challenge. There could be a, a need for us to significantly cut our budget. And we're hoping that we can still provide everything students require for success. That means more assistance. And also, we want to make sure we have the faculty and staff in place. We know that through a study from Columbia University that the impact of a associate degree represents over $200,000 to our communities through higher taxes and reduced costs of public health and public assistance and criminal justice systems. We know that a student can complete an associate degree in um, two years and spend about $10,000. And also our graduates are on the front line of this pandemic, whether they're in health or IT, whether they're in emergency services or fire safety. So we want to emphasize that Cincinnati State and the community college sector is about meeting employers' needs and helping individuals achieve their dreams. Thank you. 
thank you so much. And thanks again for your commitment to making sure everybody is moving along during these difficult times. Next up, we're gonna move on to our next speaker, Sean Comer, who happens to also be a friend. And I've had the opportunity to work directly with Sean on a lot and have to say that Xavier is lucky to have him. Sean is, bear with me one second. Sean Comer is the Director of Government Relations at Xavier University, a professor of, in the Philosophy, Politics, and Public Honors Program, teaching public policy and campaign politics, plus whatever else, no, I wasn't supposed to say that part, <laughs> in campaign politics. But I, like I said, I've had the opportunity to work directly with Sean on a lot of things, and I'm always calling on him, getting his advice and his ideas. And just in the State House, a good uh, thing for folks to know is that we're lucky that a lot of students in his program have the opportunity to intern in our offices, and it is always a pleasure to have them there. They are some of the brightest and sharpest, and we're lucky to have him over at Xavier University. So without further ado, Sean Comer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Denson, and everybody for, for having me on here, and, and also I'm honored to share the opportunity with, with uh, Dr. Posey and Sarah and Karen to be here today as well. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, Xavier University is a private Jesuit institution. We have roughly 6,500 students, 4,500 of which are undergraduate. Uh, we have 90 majors, 60 minors, uh, and, and our students uh, come from all across the country. Um, over 60% of them come from outside of the state of Ohio in some of our most recent classes. Uh, the students who come are driven by a commitment to the common good, to a development of the whole person. And so every student who comes through has to take some co take common core classes in, in philosophy and in English and in, um, and in classes across the board. So they have a, a very, I think, balanced and rounded education. Uh, I think more than anything, I'll, I'll just I'll just say that you know the past few months for, for everybody has, has been challenging. Um, it's been amazing to watch as our students, even though they struggled through the, the, the days that they had with remote learning, the faculty took classes that they, in many cases, taught for 30 plus years and had taught them a particular way, uh, very quickly uh, shifted them to try to make it so that they would be good, strong classes to, to keep students engaged. And so it's been, uh, it's been amazing to watch as, as faculty who've done this for 30 years, made that change uh, relatively overnight to try to keep our students engaged and watch the students who had their, their ways set up in terms of how they study and how they approach their, their academic setting, uh, saw those opportunities change as well and, and reacted, I think, in a way that was, that was positive and they got the most out of the experience. Certainly, uh, everybody had their own challenges and it didn't work perfectly in every instance, but I think watching sort of the resilience of each student and each faculty member as they, they worked through their challenges was reassuring to see, knowing that the challenges they had continue to be uh, severe. I think the, uh, the only other thing that I would, I would want to share is that as we, as we look ahead, we've, we've tried to be a good, good to our students and, and a good community partner. Um, as, as others mentioned, we, we, had, we refunded uh, room and board to, to students for a portion of their semester, uh, which has obviously created challenges for, the, for our budgets going forward. We've uh, worked to distribute the CARES Act funding as well to get emergency funding to our students and in addition had set up emergency funding to get it to support them in the, the days before the CARES Act so that they could afford to pay their rent and, and off-campus housing so they could afford to pay for their food and to afford transportation back home um, and have continued to work with them in, in the past months uh, as we look ahead. We've also tried to work with our partner TriHealth to, to create spaces on campus for healthcare workers and, and any other needs that might arise as they work to, to fight the pandemic. Um, and, and another point worked with the Free Store Food Bank to create a food distribution center on campus to give access to food in, in the neighborhoods surrounding. Uh, so as I said earlier, I'm happy to be here, excited to be part of the panel uh, and look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Sean. We appreciate your being here. So I am going to introduce our final panelist, um, Sarah Kilpatrick, who is the executive director of the Ohio Conference of the American Association of University Professors. And we also want to make sure to acknowledge that the president of the Ohio Conference, John McNay, uh, has joined us today as well. 
Um, so the AAUP represents uh, faculty and other academic professionals throughout the state of Ohio, and they advocate for better lives and stronger professional protections for their members. And I'm sure Sarah will be talking a little bit more about all of the work that they do um, in their um, member institutions throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, but Sarah has also been um, a leader in the labor movement and a friend. Um, and so we're really, really glad um, that you could join us and lend your perspective today. So Sarah, take it away. Okay, first of all, can you hear me okay? Okay, okay, good. There were some issues earlier, so I'm glad to hear that. Okay, um, well, I, first I wanna thank you for the invitation to be part of this forum today. And a Representative Kelly already told you a little bit about our association, but just to tell you a little bit more, uh, we have over 20 chapters around the state, including at UC, Cincinnati State, and Xavier and we represent about 6,000 faculty in total. I've been executive director for over nine years now, and I'm a proud product of two public universities in Ohio. And uh, Representative Kelly also introduced John McNay. I just wanted to let you know he's been our president of, uh, for eight years now, and he's also been a history professor at UC for 20 years. Um, I think that we all know that colleges and universities are hurting financially right now for the reasons that were mentioned by our previous guests. Um, I think we also know that this pandemic didn't cause these problems, but rather exacerbated um, what were already systemic problems for many years at our institutions. And one of the things that I want to make most clear today is that faculty want to and need to be at the table with administrations to help solve these problems. We need administrations to be very transparent with their finances so that we can work together to make sure we're preserving the academic mission. If there are to be cuts at our institutions, which seem likely, um, especially if we do not get any more federal help, uh, there must be shared sacrifice with those cuts. And we applaud the institutions that have asked for shared sacrifice starting at the very top and that have engaged in real shared governance with faculty to make decisions. Uh, we simply cannot accept faculty furloughs or program eliminations and other cuts that gut academics while administrations, athletics, and other auxiliary ventures go relatively unscathed. I think far too often it gets lost that our institutions exist to educate, not to serve as the path to the 1% for top administrators or to serve as the minor leagues for major league sports. Don't get us wrong, many administrators make valuable contributions to institutions and good administrators make a positive difference, but it is past time that we address administrative bloat. There are too many administrators at exorbitant salaries. And faculty like sports just as much as anyone else, but athletic programs must live, with, live within their means, just like academic departments have to do. It is awfully expensive to compete in Division I NCAA athletics. Ohio universities together lost $192 million on athletics last year, a deficit that had to be covered by tuition, fees, and taxpayer money. And this goes on year after year. Meanwhile, full-time faculty positions have been converted into part-time adjunct positions with no health insurance, or other benefits. Our colleges and universities must take this crisis as an opportunity to refocus on the instructional and research missions of our institutions. For decades, too many resources have been spent on endeavors peripheral to the core educational mission. And the decisions that are going to be made in the coming weeks and months are going to have long-term and lasting consequences. There are discussions of mass faculty layoffs, program closures, and drastic restructurings. We believe that there are still far too many unknowns to be making such sweeping changes at this time. Again, we need institutions to be transparent about their budgets. Unfortunately, when institutions have been faced with budget problems in the past, the tendency is almost universally to cut academics, faculty, and programs. And too often, these cuts impact diversity programs like African American Studies and Women and Gender Studies. We are seeing this happen at a couple of universities right now. Higher education makes up about 3.5% of the state operating budget, but took 14% of the governor's cuts last week. We have to do better. Those cuts disproportionately hurt our community colleges and other open access institutions that rely more heavily on the SSI dollars. Higher ed may seem like a luxury during a pandemic, but we have to remember the role of higher ed before, during, and after this crisis. Faculty are the ones that train the healthcare workers that are on the front lines of the pandemic, the doctors, the nurses, the lab technicians, the researchers, and our universities have played a critical role in COVID research. History tells us that people will turn to institutions of higher ed during the economic recovery to earn a new degree or to learn new skills or a new trade. In short, we believe that now is the time for real reform. 
Our institutions must refocus on the academic mission, and we need our government leaders to make sure Ohio's institutions are well positioned to continue providing quality and affordable education now and in the future. So again, thank you for the opportunity for being here today. Thank you so much, Sarah. I just wanted to quickly um, introduce one more person and give her the opportunity to say a few words before we move into Q&A. Um, we have a very special guest who is on the Zoom call with us today, and that is Dean Robin Leitner from the UC Blue Ash College. Dean Leitner, would you like to say a few words before we move into our Q&A here? And thank you for joining us. Thanks, sorry, it took me a moment to unmute. Um, I appreciate you recognize me and it's a pleasure to be here with everyone and thank you for taking this time to pay some attention to the work of everyone in higher ed. It has been quite the ride over the last few months. Um, and I want to echo some of the things my colleague from Xavier said, um, giving a lot of credit to the creativity of our faculty and our staff to make it work. Um, we just looked at an evaluation of the grades of our students completing classes in spring semester and compared it to previous spring semesters. Um, and we found that students did a few percentage points better than even in previous semesters. And I owe that success to the hard work of faculty who put a lot of creativity in their classes and um, staff who were just relentless in contacting students and checking in with them to see if they needed anything and round up the resources they need to make it work. So thank you everyone for being here today. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dean Leitner. Appreciate you hopping on there at the, uh, the last minute and putting you on the spot. So thank you for that. And I appreciate all you do for UC Blue Ash as well. Um, and we're gonna move right into our question and answer portion here for all of our panelists. So um, panelists, we will ask the question and then whoever would like to chime in to answer that in any fashion, please feel free to hit unmute and do so. Um, we have, um, and just a quick reminder, we are Facebook Live, and then you can also submit questions here in the Zoom group chat. So folks out there listening today, if you have any questions, please submit those questions for us, and we will get to those as quickly as we can. I'm going to start us off with the first question that was submitted from our registrations for this call today. Um, so this is a long question, bear with me here. Okay, so addressing university and college level education and reopening during a pandemic, will each university be required to have a containment plan in place and should there be confirmed positive student cases? For instance, contact tracing, tests available for all students and professors, in contact with positive individuals, isolation facilities for students that have to travel to get home, and are there any thresholds to determine a possible shutdown again? So I, I can talk a little bit about UC. So overarching, the answer is yes. We, we are working on plans in place for all of those things, for what contract trace, contact tracing looks like, for what social distancing is gonna look like in the classrooms. All those plans are underway and the experts across campus when it comes to public safety and academic affairs, all of those are at the table in terms of discussing what that looks like. So, you know, as, as we sort of phase in our approach, we're welcoming back our researchers on campus June 1st, we're gonna kind of see how that rolling out, what that looks like, and then take steps from there. Uh, this is Monica Posey. I would add, we certainly are working through the details of a plan that we can share. We also are bringing a limited number of students back in the June, July timeframe. So it will be our test case with um, temperature checks and masks and other supports and safety is our priority. We're bringing back a limited number of students because they have skills-based courses that they need to complete and we wanna make sure that they have that opportunity, but it also will allow us to prepare for the larger groups that come in later and we will have all the components necessary for social distancing and support. Thank you. I'll just, um, this is uh, Sean Comer from Xavier. I'll add that, uh, similar to Karen that we have our academic and our student life leaders and, and leaders from, from TriHealth who are all working together very closely to, to try to understand how do we uh, safely and effectively bring students back on campus and try to address all those concerns. And then also I think across the board, um, our institutions while they're, they're different are all working uh, with similar institutions across the state with our own associations to try to articulate what those challenges might be 
to, to the governor, to, to the chancellor of, of higher ed, so that should any uh, directives or, or direction come out of uh, the, the state at some point, that, that they understand where those challenges lie. And so I think we're, we're working hard to understand what, what can we do to make our campus safe, um, and also understand what the expectations will be of the, of the health department, of the Department of Higher Education, and, and the governor's office as well. Thanks, Sean. I, this is Rep. Ingram, and uh, as you see, you can see my mini-me that's there on the camera. Hopefully you can hear me. It's there because I just got some information from the uh, governor's office this morning. And, you know, uh, I'm glad, uh, President Posey, that you mentioned that part of what you are doing is ensuring that your students are able to be trained on the computers because therein lies some of the difficulty too though we are off-site and you'll be doing distance learning and remote learning some of those students really don't know how to function with this material as much as others so uh luckily that training is going on i want to ask each of you before i give the the because i don't really don't want to read everything that the, the chancellor has sent the chancellor sent information regarding the the cares act and those dollars that were there and and i know that some of you have been talking with him already at your institutions in regard to um in regard to uh what the the chancellor's office is trying to do there at higher ed so i want to ask though if and how the institutions have been involved in the distribution of the dollars that came from the uh, uh let's see we probably got about 13.9 billion dollars for higher ed and i want to know from each of you how do you know how your institutions have been involved in making those decisions about that distribution so rep ingram thanks for the question uh, the the funding and the distribution of those funds is based on a formula that was laid out in the cares act so 50 percent it's based on the number of pell enrollments you've got at your university or your institution and then from there 50% of that money goes directly to students to aid what, what in their situations and whatever their emergency circumstances are. And then the other portion of that goes to the university to offset costs. And some of that is we've been waiting for clear guidance from the Department of Education about what we can appropriately use that money for. And, and that seems to be the issue because some of the dollars that came down, though they were supposed to relate to COVID related emergency relief. And so the governor's emergency relief fund um, and the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund and of course the higher education fund is all included in there so i guess maybe we want to make sure that there is some equity that says that we are addressing uh health care for our, our students not just at the um, elementary level but also at that uh, at the upper higher ed level and so i want to make sure that though there's a formula that the formula works because you may have known that i had an issue with some of the pell grant folks um at our higher institutions ohio state being one dayton another who just laid off 400 employees so um that question was around whether or not everybody will in be included in the discussion of how those dollars get distributed um, uh, th this is Monica Posey. Uh, I just want to say that there are pockets of dollars available. Some funds go directly to the students, and we actually have an opportunity for students to complete an application and tell us their needs so that we can actually provide them with the funds. So there are various needs, whether it's housing or health care that component and then we also have the component that the school uses to cover expenses and we've been investing specifically in technology because when we look at the needs of low income students it's frequently computer and internet access and we're doing that good thank you very much that, that that's important for us to do and important for us to be included in uh i also am it was interesting to hear Sarah talk about uh, this is an opportunity. And I always think, uh, in my mind, this, the silver lining behind this thing is that there is an opportunity. And so my question to each of you is, what do you see 
um, doing differently that you always wanted to do differently, but now you have a chance? I think, um, thanks for the question. I think for you know, earlier, I touched on the sort of the creativity, and the ways that, that faculty approach the challenges. And I think that's one piece that going forward, I think there, there are some new opportunities. Uh, we had a number of faculty, uh, you know, for one example, in, in data analytics who brought in the manager of the Reds on Zoom. We made the request. And in any other situation, maybe he, he can't do that because it was supposed to be opening day when he came into the class and, and we'll be able to participate. But I think the, the concept that Zoom eliminates the, the travel time involved and sort of the, a lot of the logistics involved, a lot of our faculty took advantage of that kind of mindset to bring to ask people to come to camp, uh, to their classes who they wouldn't have otherwise even I think asked um, and had really successful experiences as a result. I can tell you, Re Representative Denson and, and Kelly were, were able to join for one of my classes and talk with students about the challenges that they face in the midst of, of making decisions in a pandemic. And I think while the ideal situation would have had them be, do that in person and actually have the conversation, I think for lots of faculty, they created new opportunities that weren't there before for their students. Um, and it worked, it worked well for, for them. Yeah, good, good. I think we have some other questions. I'm going to get to that. Thank you, Rep Ingram. I'm going to take the questions that we have over in the Zoom chat box now. So the first one that we got in, is there a collaboration from universities to bridge the conditions and deliver a voice to the systemic problems in higher education? Is that question sort of more universal or with regard to the COVID-19 health crisis? I would say um, anything that you can speak to our, our wonderful panelists about the collaboration that's going on from the universities now during this crisis would be great if you could all speak to that. Yeah, well, with the public universities, we're part of an organization, a voluntary organization called the Inter-University Council. So it's a, co a collective of all 14 public universities and institutions in the state of Ohio. And we all, you know, work across our functional areas to share, you know, lessons learned, questions, ideas. So yes, to also present those sort of collective ideas to the chancellor and to the governor as well, how this crisis is impacting uh, universities writ large, as well as what some of our challenges are before and what will be after. And, and let me say that I do know that uh, I believe Jim Tressel is the, the president or the chair of that group at this point. I'm not certain, but I know that they are working on that, having talked to the chancellor's office uh, and to their folks that, that I know that the IUC is working closely uh, and trying to make sure that what we do is comprehensive. And here again, it addresses some of those other issues that are already there. Yeah, that's right. We uh, have an opportunity right now. There's uh, committees working about what return to campus looks like across our institutions and how we're sharing best practices and what that might look like for our various institutions, which are of different shapes and sizes across the state. Great. Yes, if I could uh, add something uh, about the faculty. Um, we are working with all of our 25 chapters across the state to try to coordinate our responses because everyone is uh, suffering uh, in this situation and a, a, a lot of uh, positions are, are threatened. I got to say this, uh, this week we had a, uh, a joint uh, Zoom conference uh, led by three of our largest uh, advocacy chapters, Ohio University, Ohio State, and uh, Miami University. And there were over 150 uh, faculty on that call from across the state. And we shared a lot of ideas about how we can um, look more creatively at the financial problems we're having. And in particular, um, how we can get our institutions to move more of uh, the revenue from peripheral areas to uh, research and teaching, which is where we think more of our money ought to be, uh, ought to be placed. And just one last thing is, uh, about having some kind of opportunity for reform during this time. I think uh, to really look more creatively at our athletic programs would be a, a great thing to do. I think we need to focus on keeping the student scholarships because it's the students where we want the revenue to be spent and uh, think creatively about perhaps moving down to uh, division two or division three uh, where you can still maintain scholarships, but 
you don't have to blow so much money on all the other things that uh, Division I uh, involves. Uh, so I'll stop there. I could go on. Thanks. Thank you, John. That's actually a perfect segue into the next question that we wanted to ask. Um, that way we can get our panelists' opinion and um, Sarah from AAUP can jump in here too. Um, so the question is, is how do you think the coronavirus crisis will impact staffing? And uh, this both for instructors who are already teaching and for those aspiring to be in academia. Sure, I, I can speak on this. Um, I think we're already seeing how it's going to impact, um, you know, several institutions across the state, um, public, private, uh, have already announced um, staff layoffs, faculty layoffs. I think we're going to be hearing a lot more of that in the coming weeks and, and probably even more over the summer as well. And so, um, you know, that's why we're, we're trying to get out the message that, you know, we really need institutions to be transparent about their budgets because um, before we start cutting the academic mission, we, we need to look elsewhere for cuts. Um, and, you know, places like, for example, Ohio University, where they've been in, um, you know, some pretty bad financial um, straits for a while, and, and this exacerbated their problems. Um, you know, the, the people who are getting laid off down there, I mean, OU is the largest employer in that area. And so there are, you know, much larger issues than people um, getting laid off. I mean, it, it's, you know, what is going to happen to these communities that rely so heavily on their local institutions to be an employer? I would just add, this is Monica Posey, Cincinnati State, that we've actually in the community college sector, we've had cutbacks over the last five years. So we're pretty lean and we have a group of faculty and staff that are working so hard and absolutely committed to our mission. And they've been innovative and that's going to help us in the future, but we definitely would like to avoid budget cuts. We would like to see if there's any way the state can support us, if there's any other resources through rainy day fund or, or other ways to help us experiencing cuts. But at the same time, we are committed to our work and I feel that our teams are committed. So we're going to make it all fit together. We're gonna to put students at the forefront and continue to do the best we can. If I could just add something to what uh, Dr. Posey just said, the, uh, uh, I think one of the things that, uh, that we need to focus on is the Ohio, Ohio College Opportunity Grant. It's the only need-based source of funding for students. And if we could uh, uh, focus on protecting that fund, um, that would be, a, uh, it would be a benefit for the students. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just second what you said. I think the, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about the Ohio College Opportunity Grant over the years. Just being, it's critical to the, someone mentioned earlier, especially the students who are Pell eligible and the students who, who really need that support the most. And so, you know, ensuring that funding there, I think, is critical. Um, additionally, I think when we've talked, uh, thinking about how we, we've been in conversation with, with folks in Washington, is it's all been about we want to keep people employed. We want to have people um, to keep keep working and we want our students to have as good of experience as possible. And we know that since the, the onset of the pandemic that uh, the, the financial need of our students has just, has just continued to go up and, and we expect as we, we go through the summer and, and the strain becomes more for families that, that that will just continue to increase. And so that's been the message that we've been trying to deliver, but it's certainly, uh, I think it's a, it's a tough time right now. And, and, and no matter what uh, cuts are made, whether the cuts end, w would be with having to do with, with people or they have to do with, benefits or if there are cuts made to program budgets and operating budgets, no matter where the cuts come, I think it, it hurts faculty and it hurts students. I think the, um, this is Rep Ingram again. I, I, I appreciate your conversation. And of course, we'll take this back. Uh, being on the higher ed education uh, committee uh, is something that we take a look at or, or the DEMS, and I know that uh, Rep. Miranda is also on the Higher Education Committee, but OCOG is one of the ones that though you will increase the dollars, the question becomes, but are we really doing as much as we should be doing and, and could be doing from the state level? Uh, and that's become an argument when we look at um, 
manufacturing and other job skills and job sets. Uh, I have a question for each of you. Uh, and of course, at the community college, and, and I heard Dr. Posey say that you were already lean, but uh, with these layoffs at the institutions, would it be fair to rehire adjuncts, uh, as uh, Sarah talked about, that don't have, uh, they don't have health care, they don't have any coverage. Is that fair to the students to, for the institutions to do that? Uh, I would just say that, first of all, we do have a pretty good number of adjunct faculty and they do a wonderful job. We depend upon them and they're great teachers. We do like to invest in full-time faculty because that means that they can focus on the institution and they have more time available just for our particular students and their needs. So our hope is that we don't switch more to part-time people, uh, part-time instructors, but it's not because of the quality, it's because of the time and our ability to support them, whether it's benefits or other ways that we support our full-time faculty. So our goal is to continue that, but we are under the pressure of the budget. If I, could, if I could add just something about that adjunct question, because it's very important to us across the state. Um, you know, the, the example I'm, I'm most familiar with is UC, but I don't intend to pick on UC. This has gone on everywhere. Uh, but if you go back 10 years ago uh, in our bargaining unit, we had about 1,700 faculty. So go forward 10 years, and the university is growing by about 9,000 students. Uh, we still have 1,700 full-time faculty. <laughs> so who's doing all that extra teaching? Who's educating all these uh, students that we now have that we didn't have? Well, it's part-time people without health insurance, without retirement, often without office space. This is across the state, it's across the country. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, from our perspective, there's just no excuse for this explosion of part-time uh, instructors. Is it, is it possible to, to uh, contribute if you're just, uh, I, I've taught for 37 years at Miami, and one of the key things that I think, I've fought for a union there in vain, one of the key things is that full-time faculty invest time in committees and really care about the structure of the university. Uh, the people who are part-time have no learning term stake in the quality of the institute. I spent hundreds of hours in committees as many, most of the full-time faculty do in the course of their years. Um, but you, you really cut off, I would say, I'm so delighted by the way that you have AUP people here. I mean, I think it's literally true that the quality of the education is a function of the, the degree of empowerment of the faculty. So I think that's terrific. Thank you all. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and ask the other question that we have over here in the Zoom box because I want to make sure we're getting to all of our participants here and thank you all again for joining us today. And another um, short plug, if you have any further questions, please put them over in the Zoom group chat or if you are joining us on Facebook Live, please add your question there in the comments. Um, this question is, are there any new strategies being developed to transition our 2020 high school grads into our higher ed programs? So if our panelists could speak to this a little bit about that transition from our high school grads who are dealing with a very, very different and unexpected mode of graduation this year and as they transition into their next chapter of life in higher education. Yeah, I can speak a little bit about one of the programs we've got at UC that actually reaches into the high school around early IT and helping high school students see a future in information technology and what career readiness looks like in that regard and how we can deploy some of that curriculum at the high school level, preparing them then to enter UC. And, you know, when they go into that program, um, we've done things like, you know, this year already announced that we're waiving ACT, SAT requirements 
you know, for the incoming classes. And then also part of this program is that, you know, when they complete that year of, a year's worth of curriculum over the course of a four year high school education, they have automatic admittance to UC. So there are programs that we're looking at that might reach back into the high schools to get them not only college ready, but also career ready. Awesome, thank you, Karen. Did any of our other panelists wanna jump in on that question before we move to the next one? I'll just add that we have students this summer on um, campus or experiencing education remotely in College Credit Plus. So we do have high school students that are already connected with the college. We also have all types of partnerships with different high schools to give them exposure to careers. And that's what we find. The career exposure really makes the connection. Right now we're doing virtual events, but we do have typically many hands-on activities. And these activities during the summer are taught by full-time and adjunct faculty that do wonderful jobs and they're all committed and they serve on different committees and help the college move forward. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that um, I know we have a number of, of programs that, of, for, for that run in the summer and that run as, as students start to approach the, the academic year. And I think the more than creating new programs right now, and sorry for the baby that's making lots of noise in the background. She's not thrilled with the work from home setup we have right now. Um, but I think our big focus right now is how do we shift those programs and make them accessible online throughout the summer and, and make them available to, to potential incoming students um, it, since we're not on, on campus right now, at least not in a robust way. Um, and as we look towards hopefully returning to campus in the fall, how do we move that and still have those be effective? So I think that's where a lot of our focus has been of, of utilizing sort of the existing programs we have in place, but doing it in a way that uh, people can access from home. <laughs> If I just wanted to jump in for a second. Uh, I see that my, my dean, Robin Leitner, has posted about a program we have at UC Blue Ash. Uh, it's called the Peer Navigator Program, and it helps high school students with their application, confirmation, placement testing. And uh, she says we used it last year and it helped with our uh, summer melt, you know, the loss of students uh, during uh, summer. So I just wanted to point that out. And I think some other universities uh, from talking with other faculty that they have uh, uh, similar programs to try to encourage uh, students to continue. You know, to continue is uh, the best way we can get them to graduate and, and not lose them, right? Thank you for that. Appreciate all of your feedback and that baby is adorable, Sean. So thank you for allowing her to join us. I'm actually very much surprised that my toddler has not joined us as of yet. So we got a lucky Friday going on here. Um, okay, so I wanna ask this question um, and then we will try to close it out here in a few minutes, um, but please feel free to chime in. We would love to hear all of your perspectives on this question. Um, so we know that this pandemic obviously has changed a lot, both on and off campus, um, life as we know it. And so what changes do you think will remain beyond this current health crisis in both the immediate future and then of course, over the long term for higher education? Um, I think the, the idea that comes to my mind are both um, innovation and flexibility. I, I think we have been forced out of our comfort zones in many situations and, and required flexible thought processes and flexible environments. And I hope that that's something that we can continue to utilize as we deliver our educational mission and, and our ability to be innovative as we deliver it to students and meet students where they are. And as I had said earlier in my comments, you know, I think that we can use this as an opportunity to refocus on the academic mission. And you know, we're concerned that there are going to be long-term structural changes that are made and that we're never gonna get those things back. And so when we're talking about you know, eliminating like African-American studies program, for example, um, when we're talking about eliminating a bunch of faculty, I just don't know that we're ever gonna go back to a time where we're going to create new programs 
and hire new faculty. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the cuts are made in a responsible way and that we do focus on continuing to provide um, a liberal arts education at our universities and, you know, the kind of training um, at our community colleges that has been so valuable. I would just add to the other comment that it's so much about the technology and the CEO of Microsoft said that the technology transformation that was happening already had a two year path and we just pulled it into a two month timeline. And those learnings and the positive experiences will really continue. How we celebrate, how we teach, is going to continue in the future and we want to take the best from what we've experienced in this accelerated time frame. I'll just second um, what, what, what Karen mentioned in, about uh, flexibility. I think that for, for many of us, this has created uh, and pushed our boundaries for how to be flexible and how do we approach our job in a way that we can still make it successful. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, with, with your faculty changing the way they approach it, it's just, we heard it from students over and over again that they were appreciative of the way that faculty and staff sort of bent over backwards to make their experience as positive possible, knowing that everybody's in a challenging and a tough situation, whether they're holding a, you know, a baby on their lap or whether they have grandparents they care for or whether they you know, don't have great internet access and are trying to figure that out. I think the, the flexibility and sort of the, the care for one another, at least to this point, I think it's something that we'll take forward. I think we've got a lot, this is Rep Ingram, I think we've got a lot to look forward to and I, I, I applaud all of your work and, and all that you've done and all that you'll continue to do and, and I'll keep uh, harping on the, the Chancellor's office to make sure that they're inclusive, but, you know, we go back and forth about some of this stuff and and I know that um, Chancellor Gardner is working hard. He's worked with education for a long time. I will say this, he's come a long way on his thinking. And so um, let's see what happens. Well, we do want to make sure that we are staying on schedule with um, getting everybody out of here at 12 noon. Uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists that joined us and great conversation. and. Certainly, as Rep. Ingram said, there is a lot going on, a lot to know, and a lot we got to be looking at. And so it just helps us do our job better when we're able to hear these conversations as well. Um, so we are going to go ahead and wrap up. I want to thank everyone for joining. We will be back next week, the 22nd, same place, same time, 11 a.m. We'll have some restaurant owners and barbers and beauticians on to talk about their experience and how opening up has been. So get the word out. Let your folks know and we hope to see everybody here again next week. Thanks so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you.